when I was first told about this object by our curator of archaeology, I was just absolutely fascinated by it. On one end of the stone, it mentions the Emperor Constantine. On the other end is this chap called Carausius. And what's interesting is that Carausius um, got a bit above his station, I suppose. He was in Britain, he was commanding the troops in Britain, and he declared himself Emperor of Britain. Uh, stole money that was meant to be sent back to Rome uh, and made himself very unpopular, so much so that after something like seven years' rule, uh, he was killed by his finance minister. And as a result of all these wrongdoings, Rome, in their greatness, I guess it probably was Constantine, signed him the, the phrase damnation of memory. But it basically means that all reference to him was erased. And the interesting thing is the stone that was turned upside down and buried in the earth and the new name of Constantine was carved on it. One end goes in the ground, the, the Carausius end, and the end that sticks up is Constantine. I just think it's a, it's a brilliant and fascinating story. The word Genii Cuculati just means gods in hooded cloaks. Um, we affectionately call them the three hoodies because no one can say Geni Kukulati apart from Tim. Um, so the cloaks in question are the normal outer dress of local people in Britain, France and Germany. And this kind of sculpture is found in the Cotswolds area and all along Hadrian's Wall as well. They're normally shown in groups of three. Um, three, as we all know, is a magic number and that's a typical Celtic habit of triplifying their deities to increase their power. Um, this is all very interesting, but the reason it's my Tully treasure is because I use the three hoodies with a group of young people focusing on one object from the collection. So the young people saw this object, came up with their own interpretation of it. They thought that each figure represented different stages in your life. So each figure is actually holding something different according to the young people. So the figure representing birth is holding an egg. And the figure representing death is holding a skull. And the one representing rebirth is holding a stone. And this was a complete new interpretation of this object. And it really just brought home to me that history isn't just one interpretation of the facts, it's many. And that everyone's interpretation is as valid as the next person's. I've been fascinated by this object since I first saw it. At first glance, it looks modern, like a stone tennis ball. It's a similar size and fits snugly in the hand. It's hard to believe it's over 3,000 years old. It seems incredible that they've been worked using very basic stone tools, but experiments have shown that this is possible. Like a lot of objects in this period, no one really knows what they were used for. There are several theories. Some of the more unlikely uses proposed are ball bearings to move stones for circles, in the production of leather, or attached to thongs as throwing weapons. It seems unlikely that so much care would go into a purely functional item. I like the idea it was an object in its own right. So much care and effort has gone into making it. Someone has spent many hours carving and grinding it into shape. Maybe it had a ritual significance or for trade with neighbouring tribes. One theory is that these balls were used like a speaking stick. They were passed round a group of people and only the person holding it had the right to speak. In the end, this object and others like it sit on shelves in museums and enigmatically hold on to their secrets. I rather like that. I had a very interesting conversation with a gentleman from the uh, US. He was in the US forces and he came to the border region specifically to track down his roots. He was an Armstrong. I'm an Elliot, so we uh, had a bit of a sort of a banter, um, and then from that uh, sort of very light-hearted conversation, I showed him the painting of Gilnocky Tower, which is in the Reaver Gallery, um, and it was the home of Johnny Armstrong. He was very happy to uh, find out this information, and following our conversation, the following day, he visited the area of Gilnocky Tower, and one week later, uh, on his return to the US, he sent me a very nice email thanking me and the museum for all of their help in helping him track down his own family history of the borders. The tile staircase is part of the Tully House Victorian extension, and it gives a real sense of the original museum. The tiles were chosen by C.J. Ferguson, who was a Carlisle architect, he designed the building, which opened in 1893. The tiles are an amazing example of the Victorian craze for tiles. Glazed tiles were used extensively during the Victorian building boom. They became so popular because they were hygienic, they were easy to clean and beautiful to look at. 
The tiles on the staircase are a mixture of beautiful relief moulded floral designs and plain tiles and I love the way the light catches the glazed surface. They're complemented by an elegant wrought iron staircase inset with the City of Carlisle heraldic shields. And this part of the building is used to display the museum's art collections to stunning effect. I like the fortunate circumstance that the Roman gallery is not only located within the walls of the Roman fort, but that it also provides an historic link to the fort at the original level where the Romans once walked, trained, slept and lived almost 2,000 years ago. Looking at the various local artefacts on show in the display cases, the armour, shoes, weapons, etc., it becomes increasingly relevant and exciting that these often personal items, many in need of mending and repair, were unearthed from the ground immediately below their feet. I'm fascinated by the stories told by Tally House security staff about their ghostly encounters they've had in the old Tally House part of the building. The Little Girl Ghost is a story of particular interest. A lady visitor reported to the staff member in old Tully House the little girl had been playing on her own. On investigating, the staff member found no child there. Last year I was having a meeting with our Curator of Art. We were in the function room and the door to the lecture theatre leading into Old Tully House was open. I noticed a little girl playing at the top of the lecture theatre stairs. I didn't think too much into it as it was half term so there were lots of children around and presumed the parents were close by. We checked around for the girl but there was no one there. I checked in the Old Tully House gallery but the museum assistant said no one had come out of there either. Could it have been the little girl ghost? Who knows? But now I keep a lookout for her whenever I'm in Old Tully House. I chose this object because it is effectively a highly evocative piece of Hanoverian propaganda from a critical period of British history, the 1745 Rebellion. The subject of the painting is Prince William Augustus, aka the Duke of Cumberland. Here he is portrayed as a British war hero. In the background, the Jacobite army is being crushed by government forces. But the Duke of Cumberland is a rather controversial figure in British history and inspired some rather unusual nicknames. Hanoverian supporters were so happy to commemorate the defeat of the Jacobites at Culloden in 1746 that they named a flower after the Duke, Sweet William. In Scotland, the defeated Jacobites had a rather different idea, and after the slaughter of wounded Jacobites at Culloden Moor, the Duke was simply known as the Butcher, the Scots also nicknamed the irritating common weed ragwort Stinking Billy after the Duke. For me, the artistic representation of this historical figure is intriguing. Was he a hero or a villain? Certainly, if the Jacobites had taken power, we would be looking at a very different depiction of the Duke. It's just a shiny wooden box with some strings stretched over it when you look at it. It was made in a small northern Italian town about the same time that tobacco arrived in England. Elizabeth I had been on the throne for a handful of years. The Spanish Armada was more than 20 years away. But take these strings and drag some sticky hair from a horse's tail across them and they make a noise. Put your fingers in the right place at the right time, you might get a tune or you might drive the dog mad if you don't do it right. Primitive, isn't it? But when this violin was made in the 1560s, it was the pinnacle of perfection. And it's something that's not been bettered to this day. There'd been instruments played with bows for literally centuries. But in the middle of the 1500s, a man, 50 something years old, an instrument maker, had been busy developing some really, really smart ideas and choosing woods that were soft or hard enough so that when the strings vibrate under the bow, that wood would vibrate to make just the right amount of air move just enough to make a nicer noise than previously anything else had been able to do. It's as much science as it is art and beauty. But you know, the whole point of all that effort by that 50-something Italian, Andrea Amati, in inventing the modern four-string violin was to produce an instrument that could be taken anywhere easily and was so easy to play that any illiterate musician of the day could play it. <laughs> 